Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse number 9. And it says, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may have your seats. We've been in this sermon series on prayer. And in the first installment of this series, we answered the question, why pray? And now we are looking in the second installment of our series, Lord, teach us to pray. Last week, Jesus gave us some preliminary instructions before he taught specifically how to pray. And he taught us on last week, don't be like the hypocrites, for they like to show their righteousness, their piety, their religion for the sake of men. Don't be like the pagans who just use vain repetitions. But he said, pray to your heavenly father who already knows what you need. Go into your private place. And it is important that we understand that Jesus was not teaching his disciples the specifics on where to pray as if that were the problem, but his attempts were to purify their motives when it came to prayer. And so now Jesus says, pray then like this. King James says, I believe, pray in this manner. In other words, here is the model for praying. It is important that we understand that he said, pray then like this, or pray in this manner. He didn't say, pray these words. Now, at the same time, it is not unbiblical to pray this prayer. This, this is probably the most known, most popular prayer in all of Scripture. And the problem is that this is probably the most popular prayer in all of Scripture. Because we know it, we lose the wonder and the awe in these words. So when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray here in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9, he's giving them a template for how to pray, a model for how to pray. And he first says, pray then like this, our Father. The first thing that Jesus teaches in this prayer is about the fatherhood of God. The fatherhood of God. Jesus opens the prayer by teaching his disciples that they have a unique relationship with God. He's not just almighty God. He's not just sovereign Lord. He's not just master and ruler of all, but he is indeed their heavenly father. You have to understand that this is somewhat radical and revolutionary. Only approximately 14 times in all of the Old Testament uh, do the Jews call God father. And here, every time, Almost every time that Jesus prays in the New Testament, he addresses God as Father. And so Jesus is teaching his disciples that he is their heavenly Father. Now, when we talk about the fatherhood of God, it is important that we know that the Bible does not teach that we are one big happy family on the earth. 
Let me say that again. The Bible does not teach that we are one big happy family on the earth. Let me review some of what I said last Sunday. God is the father of all in one sense that he is the creator of all. That, that, that is true. He is the creator of everyone on the earth. However, he is not the father of all. We must understand here, let me go this route, that there are two families on the earth. God has a family and the devil has a family. Let me put my weight on it, and I got a lot of it. John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, and he says, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. Jesus teaches clearly that those who reject him, being the son of God, and the truth that he proclaims are part of the family of the devil. That came from Jesus himself. Ephesians 2 calls these children of the devil, they are, he calls, Paul calls them sons of disobedience. They, they live according to the passions of their flesh. They carry out the desires of the body and the mind, and by nature, they are children of wrath. They are condemned to judgment which is spending eternity apart from God. If you don't believe John 8, 44, I can take you to 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, that, that proves that there are two distinct groups of people on the earth. Here's what 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that, that's believers, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Are the reason why here it is the second group the world did not know us is that they did not know him. The, this verse shows that there is a clear delineation between the people of God characterized by knowing God and the people called the world characterized by not knowing God. There are two families on the earth. John chapter 1, verses 12, teaches us clearly that God has an exclusive family. Here's the word. But to all who received him, that's Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Friends, those who do not believe in Jesus Christ are not a part of the family of God. So they must be a part of another family. So you may be wondering, you may be here today, and you may be asking, how does one become a member of the family of God? The Bible teaches that we have to be adopted by the Father. You, you, you can't just be born into it by natural birth because the Bible teaches we are born into sin. By nature, we are sinners, and because we are sinners, we sin. We are born outside the family of God. However, God loved us so much that he didn't want us to be outside of his family. Here's what Paul said in Galatians chapter 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that they might receive adoption as sons. Friends, the only way to be a member in the family of God is through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And therefore, they can approach his throne as a child approaches his father. What's then the significance of the fatherhood of God? 
J.I. Packer, famous theologian, said, we are loved no less than the one whom God called his beloved son. Thank you. Yes, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. I'm loved as a son of God. I'm loved just like the son of God. 1 John 3, 1, we just read it. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. The good news of being loved by the Father is that his love is unconditional. Friends, I'm, I'm about to forewarn you. This is your shout right here. There is absolutely nothing, shout nothing, that can separate us from the love of God. Even when we forsake him and leave him, even we, when we rebel against him, the good news is that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Not life, nor death, not things present, nor things to come, not things here on the earth. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Even when I'm unlovely, he still loves me. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. So he's our father, Jesus teaches his disciples. Friends, because he is our father, that means he's, he's always more ready to hear us than we are to pray to him. Because he is our father, he cares for us, provides for us, protects us, keeps us. And Jesus says it is to this father that we are to pray. If God is the father of those who believe, then that means that there then is a family of God to which we all belong. We see in this prayer the family of God. Is it in there, Brandon? Yes. Here it is. Our father. First word, our. When we look at the disciples' prayer or the model prayer, one observation is there are no first-person singular or plural pronouns in this prayer. In other words, there is no I, me, or my in this prayer. He says, our Father. Now, now the point here is not to teach you that you cannot pray for yourself or make personal requests to God. What we are to learn from this is, is, is that Jesus is reminding us that when we enter into a relationship with God, we enter into relationship with his people. This is important. When we enter into a relationship with God, we enter into relationship with his people. When we are saved by Christ, we are saved into his body. We, we are participants in this community called the church. And Jesus reminds us that, that our prayers should be others-oriented. Our prayers should include our family. Now, 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 I know why y'all got so quiet. Because what I am saying is very countercultural. One of the besetting sins of evangelicalism is our obsession with individualism. I said it, and I'm going to say it again. One of the besetting sins of evangelicalism is our obsession with individualism. We tend to think about nearly everything only as they relate to me and mine. Watch this. We celebrate and advocate for personal liberty, which is not bad. However, this celebration and advocation for personal liberty comes at the expense of the community. How do I know? Because we don't value others in the community of faith. 
How do I know? We don't fight for their interest. We consider our own interest. Because we only advocate what's best for us and ours is how I know. And Jesus here teaches that prayer should be others oriented. We should pray for what's good for the community. Watch this. Because what's good for the community must be good for me. Friends, I know this is very countercultural, but we were created, we have been baptized into the body of Christ. Jesus says, pray our Father. And then he says this. He teaches his disciples about the fatherhood of God, teaches them that they are part of now the family of God, He teaches them that they have a very intimate relationship with God, that their God can be known by them. And so on one hand, he brings God close to them, but he reminds them that he's not one of you, though. What do you mean? He says, pray this way, our Father in heaven. He moves from the fatherhood of God and the familyhood of God to remind them that there is a farness when it comes to God. In other words, he is not earthly. He's heavenly. He, he's far from us in the sense that he is separate from and independent of us concerning his nature and his humanity. He, he is high and holy. He he is not like us. His ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. He's separate from sinners. His nature cannot be fully exhausted. He, He cannot be fully understood. He is enthroned over all creation. The God that we pray to is unlike any other being. He's our Father in heaven. Therefore, when you pray, you should approach him with reverence, awe, and humility. You, you don't come to God in prayer with some cavalier attitude. You don't approach God in prayer acting as, as if you're doing him a favor. You don't approach God in favor as if you deserve to be there. You, this is a holy and majestic God that we're praying to. He's our Father in heaven. And so we approach him with all humility and reverence. Now, let let, let me speak to someone here. Very basic observation, but it's got to be preached. He's our Father in heaven, not our Father on earth. Why do you preach this, Brandon? Because many of us have earthly fathers to which we have complicated relationships or no relationship with at all. And Jesus is reminding and teaching his disciples that your heavenly father is nothing like an earthly father. Some of you can't get with this because you had spectacular fathers. And praise God for that. That is a blessing. You had fathers. They were present. They were at every event. They were affirming. They were accepting. They were a provider of providers. They were loving. They were kind. They were patient. They were caring. caring. They were a good father. And so maybe you're saying, yeah, I had a good one. What Jesus is teaching you is still that your father in heaven is unlike your father on earth. If you had a good father on earth, then then you have a great father in heaven. Your father, your good father on earth is nothing compared to your father in heaven. Let me see, let me see, let me see if I can... Call a witness to help me preach right here. Someone would just say, he's a good, good father. 
He's perfect in all his ways. He would never leave us nor forsake us. He's our Father in heaven. For those who may not have a relationship with their earthly father, here's what the Bible says in Psalm 68. He's the father to the fatherless. He won't fall down on the job because he never slumbers nor sleeps. You don't have to worry about a lack of resources when it comes to this father because the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the world that dwell therein. This heavenly father owns the cattle upon a thousand hills. He owns so much cattle that they stop counting the cattle and they just start counting the hills where the cattle were. So Jesus says, pray Our Father, who art in heaven. Let me shock y'all real quick. I am finished. Jesus teaches his disciples, pray this way, our Father. For somebody in this room today, the response that's required from you is to ponder, reflect on this truth. Whose family are you in? Are you a member of the family of God or a member of the family of the devil? Whose father? Whose family are you in? You are not here By happenstance, you are not here by chance. God sovereignly ordered your steps so that you would stop at the Bridge Church this morning to hear that there is a Father in heaven who loves you despite who you are. You've forsaken him. You've rebelled against him. And he says, I love you so much that I'm going to send my own son to die your death, to take your penalty so that you can be adopted into my family. And he's calling you today to say, come be a part of my family. And so the response from, for you from, for, from today's sermon is to put your trust in him, in him, in Jesus Christ alone so that you can pray and be right with this Father in heaven. You may be here today and you're saying, Brandon, I'm saved. What now? It's very simple. Jesus has given us a model for praying. We start by addressing our Father who art in heaven. We don't jump right in to our wants, our request, but we pray to our Heavenly Father who loves us, cares for us, and invites us to be in communion with him. He invites us to be in his presence. He invites us to boldly and with confidence come before his throne through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's our heavenly father. How deep the father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. So maybe for, for, for as we learn how to pray from the master, we also reflect, remember, and celebrate that we are loved by this good, good father who adopted us and to his family. The great thing about this adoption is that it's forever. We are forever in the family of God. That's why we celebrate that nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Because even 
us being trifling cannot separate us from God's love. We are forever in the family. God will never sign away his parental rights. We've now come up to the time where we remember what Jesus Christ has done for us so that we could be a part of God's family. Jesus paid this price by dying on the cross. And he said to the rest of my family, I want you to remember me. And he gave us a meal to remember his sacrifice that he paid for us. We call this meal the Lord's Supper, and it is for those who are a part of the family of God. If you're not yet a part of the family of God, rather than partaking in this meal with us, we would ask for you to take the time to reflect on these truths as you pass the elements. That God is holy, and he created us for his glory to worship him. But we sought our own self-interest by sinning, by breaking God's law. By nature and by choice, we are sinners. And as a result, we deserve eternal separation from God in hell. But God loved us so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die our death, the worst death ever. Jesus was murdered, killed, tortured for your sin and my sin. And he gives us this free gift. And we can either today receive it or reject it. You receive it, you're a part of the family of God. And you'll have eternal life. You reject it, you're a part of the family death. And you, uh, uh, you're the family of the devil and you are by nature a children of wrath. And that's what we need saving and rescuing from is God's wrath. How could a loving God send anyone to hell? Because he's not just loving. He's holy. He's just. He's righteous. I know Christian judges here on the earth. There are loving people. But we never asked of these Christian judges, how could a loving judge send a criminal to die? We never ask that question. But it's only to God, who is a judge himself of all men, that we say he's unjust by giving people what they rightly deserved and earned. But, 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 but God, why did he create people to, to, to go to hell? Sinners birth sinners. God created man good. And man, by choice, decided to break God's law to sin, Adam. And so all men by birth are in Adam. And because they are in Adam, they fall under God's condemnation because they are sinners. Oh, but the good news is that there was a second Adam. And this second Adam lived according to the will of his heavenly father, was sinless. And all those who put their trust in Jesus Christ, they are now born again and are in this second Adam. They are in Christ. And they become a part of the Man, you may come forward.